Um, so uh, this book came out of nowhere. I didn't know I was going to write it. I wasn't planning to write it. I knew I had to write another book because that's what I do. Um, and usually no sooner have I finished one than somebody starts bothering me about the next one, usually myself. Um, and I'm always, um, I usually have a few candidates that have started to appear typically toward the latter stages of writing a book. The next book begins to kind of call out to you. Um, and sometimes there, there's more than one next book calling out to you, like the sirens calling out to Odysseus. And I mean, it's very much like that. I have to kind of lash myself to the mast um, to ignore their temptations. And usually what they're singing is something like, I'm going to be really short. <laughs> I'm not going to take five and a half years to write. Maybe you should just stop writing this dumb book you're working on that you wasted all this time on and just come write me. You could probably write me in two weeks. <laughs> and I've learned over time to ignore that because it's, it's a lie um, and it's a trap. Um, but uh, And there were a few books I was thinking of writing as in, in the wake of finishing Telegraph Avenue, my last book. Um, and one of them sort of had won out in my mind and I was reading for it and researching and um, it was going to have... Um, a period setting to a degree, and I, although I wasn't entirely sure what period, and I was trying to get a sense of that, and I was planning and preparing in various ways, and at a certain point I got to a point and I thought, okay, I've got, I have all these ideas, and I've just sort of been carrying them around in my mind for a few weeks now. I'm going to go out to the studio where I work behind my house and um, just start jotting things down, see what has stuck and see what um, I can come up with. And maybe I'll even be able to get a start on something. And I went out, and I sat down in the chair. And I found myself thinking about um, a story that I had heard. And I think the reason I was thinking about this story was because I had just finished reading a novel, a wonderful short novel by Dennis Johnson called Train Dreams, um, which is a beautiful novel. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. And um, and I loved every bit of it. I loved it so much that as soon as I finished it, I started it and again at the beginning and read the whole thing um, immediately, which, um, I mean, for me, is I think it's very high praise, and it's something I've done very rarely. It's a little easier when a book's only 125 pages long to begin with or whatever that one is. Um, but in this book, somewhere in the middle of that book, he has his character who's an old man at this point, and that book, Train Dreams, does a much more efficient job than I did of telling an entire man's life in the span of one novel. And when his main character is a very old man who has lived all his life on the frontier in, in uh, Washington and Idaho in the 1880s, 1890s, and he's now it's 1950, and he's a very old man. He's 56 or 7. And he goes down to the small town in wherever it is, Idaho or Montana, I can't remember, and a train, a transcontinental train has broken down and is waiting for some kind of repair. And people have started to notice that riding on this train is Elvis Presley. When he's still young and still, you know, in my memory, he's wearing a gold suit. But I don't know if he's really wearing a gold suit. Or maybe the narrator just thinks of him as a golden boy. And um, I love the way this big arc of American history, of American popular culture, was intersecting in real life popular culture was intersecting with the fictional life of the man who's the protagonist of the novel who led, led a very anonymous life. And, um, and I think that planted the idea in my head that I found myself thinking about this story that I had heard about my mother's father's brother, my great uncle Jack, who um, worked most of his life as a salesman and he um, sold, he worked, worked for a long time for a company in New York that sold office printed office forms, um, you know, um, invoice pads and all the kind of pre-printed forms, that, especially in the old days that businesses relied on carbon paper and so on. And um, uh, the story I heard is that one day he worked in the Puck building in New York City and one day he got fired. And the reason he got fired was because somebody was a friend of somebody who was a friend of the owner of this company and that person was a friend of Alger Hiss, the um, convicted perjurer 
who was accused of spying for the Soviet Union, um, and he had had a long distinguished career as an American diplomat, and he was a, a distinguished attorney, and it was this big Cold War era case, and he was finally sent to prison, federal prison for perjury, and when he got out, he was a disgrace and nobody would hire him. And um, he got this lousy job, and um, my Uncle Jack had to be let go to make room for him on the payroll. And the more I started thinking about that story, which had nothing to do with the book that I thought I was going to be writing, the more I, something about it appealed to me. And I started to try to imagine the scene of what happened that day. How did he find out? And what did he do when he heard the news? And really before I was even aware of it, I was already writing the scene. And I immediately, reflexively, made a switch from saying my great uncle to my grandfather. Now my grandfather didn't work for this company and never got fired and it was not his story at all, it was his brother's story. So as soon as I made that switch, I was in the land of fiction. I, and I, I, was, I gave myself license thereby to invent as much as I wanted to invent. But at the same time, it also felt like the right decision because it was um, more intimate to talk about my grand, my, I, I, if it's my grandfather I'm talking about, there's, I have more at stake in the story personally than if it's my grandfather's brother, um, who I knew as a kid and you know, he, I liked him, but uh, he, he, he just couldn't possibly mean as much to me narratively um, as, he, as my grandfather did. Um, so I just started writing. And in a little bit I'm gonna read to you what, what came of that. Um, but after a few days of work, I realized I needed more information. And I realized I had a few things that I was going to need to change. And one of them was that um, I needed this to be happening in the late 1950s. And my, grand my uncle Jack got fired in the mid-60s. By then, Alger Hiss had already had one other job getting out of prison. So I made, I made the switch from the paper company to his first job when he got out of prison, which I was able to find on the internet, which was working for a, a company that you're going to hear about in a moment. And, um, <clears throat> And I thought, well, I need more, in, I need more facts to distort. Um, I need more just raw material that I can work with here. Whatever I could get would be great. So I thought, well, I know. I'm going to ask um, my Uncle Jack, who died 30 years ago or more. But I'll ask his daughter, my cousin Fran, and her daughter, my cousin Jessica, see what they remember. So I emailed them both. I said, what do you guys remember about Uncle Jack getting fired from his job? Um, to make room for Alger Hiss. And my cousin Jessica, who's in my just generation, said, I never heard that story. <laughs> and her mother, uh, Fran, said, that's not how I heard the story. <laughs> what I heard, I, I don't think my father ever got fired from any job he ever had. He, what I heard was that one day he just came home from work and he said to my mother, you're not going to believe who's working in the office form supply business or whatever it was called. You know, I imagine them. Um, it's sort of like a Barry Levinson scene with all these office paper supply guys sitting around some diner and Alger Hiss walks in and says, I'm one of you now. Um, so, um, you know, then I was like, where did I, why did I hear, who did I hear it from that he got fired? Why do, why do I know this version of the story? I was pretty sure it was my grandfather who had told me that. And so then I asked my mother and I said, what do you remember about Uncle Jack getting in, Alger Hiss, the Alger Hiss story. And she said, oh yeah, he got fired from his job to make room on the payroll for Alger Hiss. And I said, well, that's what I heard too. So that's when, that was about four or five days into the writing the book, that's when I became aware of what the sort of theme or the subject matter, at least one of the themes of this book was going to be, was, which is the idea of where, how families generate their histories and how history is generated, is shaped in a family by some strange combination of denial, yearning, faulty memory, accurate memory. Um, you know, and all of us with siblings um, have had the experience of, you know, remembering some incident that happened where you were both eyewitnesses, you were both there, and you know, and you're like, and then dad came in and, and he, you know, he threw the, 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 uh, diving mask across the room and, and then your brother's like, dad wasn't there. Like, yes, I remember him being there. Like, no, I'm totally sure he was not there. You're wrong. So, you know, in that context and in the context that I was in with my Uncle Jack 
and my grandfather, who, who was right? Who was telling the truth? Whose version was correct? We will never know. I can never know. And so what I en ended up deciding to do is to try to, in, belatedly, in the absence of the actual people whom I was too foolish to consult when I could have, and I, whom I was you know, too callow to um, realize were actually human beings um, you know, who had had real lives and not just sort of the little set of caricatures that we tend to reduce our grandparents to, um, that I was, you know, what I was gonna try to do was invent my own grandparents. Um, sort of start over again and do a better job this time of knowing them <laughs> than I had the first time. Um, so, I'm gonna read to you. Do I have some water up here? Or it's over here, hold on, one, excuse me. It's not, I won't, it's not very long, it's about, it'll take me about three hours. This is how I heard the story. When Alger Hiss got out of prison, he had a hard time finding a job. He was a graduate of Harvard Law School, had clerked for Oliver Wendell Holmes and helped charter the United Nations, yet he was also a convicted perjurer and notorious as a tool of international communism. He had published a memoir, but it was dull stuff and no one wanted to read it. His wife had left him he was broke and hopeless. In the end, one of his remaining friends took pity on the bastard and pulled a string. Hiss was hired by a New York firm that manufactured and sold a kind of fancy barrette made from loops of piano wire. Feather Combs Incorporated had gotten off to a good start, but had come under attack from a bigger competitor that copied its designs, infringed on its trademarks, and undercut its pricing. Sales had dwindled. Payroll was tight. In order to make room for Hiss, somebody had to be let go. In an account of my grandfather's arrest in the Daily News for May 25th, 1957, he is described by an unnamed coworker as the quiet type. <laughs> to his fellow salesman at Feathercombs, he was a Hamburg on the coat rack in the corner. He was the hardest working but least effective member of the Feathercomb sales force. On his lunch breaks, he holed up with a sandwich and the latest copy of Sky and Telescope or Aviation Week. It was known that he drove a Crosley, had a foreign born wife and a teenage daughter and lived with them somewhere in deepest Bergen County. Before the day of his arrest, my grandfather had distinguished himself to his coworkers only twice. During game five of the 1956 World Series, when the office radio failed, my grandfather had repaired it with a vacuum tube prized from the interior of the telephone switchboard. And a Feathercombs copywriter reported once bumping into my grandfather at the Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey, where the foreign wife was, of all things, starring as Serafina in the Rose Tattoo. Beyond this, Nobody knew much about my grandfather, and he, that seemed to be the way he preferred it. People had long since given up trying to engage him in conversation. He had been known to smile, but not to laugh. If he held political opinions, if he held opinions of any kind, they remained a mystery around the offices of Feathercombs Incorporated. It was felt he could be fired without damage to morale. Shortly after nine o'clock on the morning of the 24th, the president of Feathercombs heard a disturbance outside his office, where a quick-witted girl had been positioned to filter out creditors and tax inspectors. A male voice spoke with urgency that scaled rapidly to anger. The intercom on the president's desk buzzed and buzzed again. He heard a chime of glass breaking. It sounded like a telephone when you slammed down the receiver. Before the president could rise from his chair to see what the matter was, my grandfather muscled into the room. He brandished a black handset, in those days a blunt instrument, 
that trailed three feet of frayed cord. Back in the late 1930s, when he wasn't hustling pool, my grandfather had put himself through four years at Drexel Tech by delivering pianos for Wanamaker's department store. His shoulders spanned the doorway. His kinky hair, escaped from its daily paste down of brill cream, wobbled atop his head. His face was so flushed with blood that he looked sunburned. I never saw anyone so angry, an eyewitness told the Daily News. You could almost smell smoke coming off him. For his part, the president of Feathercombs was astonished to discover that he had approved the firing of a maniac. What's this about, he said. It was a pointless question, and my grandfather disdained to answer it. He was opposed to stating the obvious. Most of the questions people asked you, he felt, were there to fill up dead space, curtail your movements, divert your energy and attention. Anyway, my grandfather and his emotions were never really on speaking terms. He took hold of the frayed end of the telephone cord, he wound it twice around his left hand. The president tried to stand up, but his legs got tangled in the knee hole of his desk. His chair shot out from under him and toppled over, casters rattling. He screamed. It was a fruity sound, <laughs> halfway to a yodel. As my grandfather fell on top of him, the president twisted himself toward the window overlooking East 57th Street. He just had time to notice that passersby seemed to be crowding together on the sidewalk below. My grandfather looped the cord of the handset around the president's throat. He had maybe two minutes before the rocket of his anger burned up its fuel and fell back to earth. That would be ample time. During World War II, he had been trained in the use of a garrote. He knew that done properly, strangulation was short work. Oh, my God, said the secretary, Miss Mangle, making a late appearance on the scene. She had reacted quickly when my grandfather first burst into her office, smelling, she would afterward recall, like wood smoke. She had managed to buzz twice before my grandfather grabbed the handset away from her. She picked up, he picked up the intercom. He yanked the handset cord from the base. You'll have to pay for that, Miss Mangle said. When he told me this story 32 years later, my grandfather put a check mark of admiration beside Miss Mangle's name. But with his rocket only halfway up the slope of its parabola, he took her words as provocation. He threw the base of the intercom out the window of Miss Mangle's office. The chiming noted by the president had been the sound of the intercom sailing through a spider web of glass into the street. Hearing a cry of outrage from below, Miss Mangle went to the window to look. Down on the sidewalk, a man in a gray suit was sitting, looking up at her. There was blood on the left lens of his round spectacles. He was laughing. There's a footnote to that sentence which says, my grandfather knew only that the man he had accidentally beamed, fortunately, the intercom had only grazed his skull, declined to press charges. The Daily News identifies his victim as Yiri Nosek, head of the Czechoslovakian delegation to the August body that Alger Hiss had helped to charter. <laughs> this is the first time the high-ranking red has been hit by a flying telephone, the Daily News reported with a straight face, adding, Nosek said that as a good Czech, he was obliged to laugh off anything that didn't kill him. <laughs> People stopped to help the man. The doorman announced that he was going to call the police. That was when Miss Mangle heard her boss screaming. She turned from her window to run into his office. At first glance, the office appeared to be empty. Then she heard the tap of a shoe against a linoleum floor. A tap, another tap. The back of my grandfather's head rose from behind the desk, then sank again. Brave Miss Mangle went around the desk. Her boss lay sprawled on his belly on the polished floor. My grandfather straddled his back, hunched forward, applying the impromptu garrote. 
The president bucked and thrashed and tried to roll himself over. The only sound was the toes of his cordovan bucks trying to get purchase against the linoleum. Miss Mangle snatched up a letter opener from the president's desk and jabbed it into my grandfather's left shoulder. In my grandfather's reckoning, many years later, this action merited another check mark. The point of the letter opener sank only half an inch or so into meat, but the bite of metal blocked some meridian in the flow of my grandfather's rage. He grunted. It was like I woke up, he said, when he told me this part of the story for the first time during the last week of his life. He unwound the cord from the president's neck. He peeled it from the grooves it had cut into the flesh of his own left hand. The handset clattered against the floor. With a foot on either side of the president, he stood up and took a step away. The president flopped onto his back and raised himself into a sitting position, then sledded backward on his ass into a notch between two filing cabinets. He sobbed for air. When his face had hit the floor, he'd bitten his lower lip, and now his teeth were dyed pink. My grandfather turned to face Miss Mangle. He plucked out the letter opener and laid it on the president's desk. When one of his rages wore off, you could see regret flooding his eyes like seawater. He dropped his hands to his sides. Forgive me, he said to Miss Mangle and to the president. I suppose he was also saying it to my mother, 14 at the time, and to my grandmother, though arguably she was as much to blame as my grandfather. There was scant hope of forgiveness, but my grandfather did not sound as if he expected or even wanted to find any. Just a tiny little bit more. At the end of my grandfather's life, his doctor prescribed a powerful hydromorphone against the pain of bone cancer. A lot of Germans were busy knocking holes in the Berlin Wall around that time. And I showed up to say goodbye to my grandfather, just as Delauded was bringing its soft hammer to bear on his habit of silence. Out flowed a record of his misadventures, his ambiguous luck, his feats and failures of timing and nerve. He had been installed in my mother's guest bedroom for almost two weeks. And by the time I arrived in Oakland, he was getting nearly 20 milligrams a day. He started talking almost the minute I sat down in the chair by his bed. It was as if he had been waiting for my company, but I believe now that he simply knew he was running out of time. The recollections emerged in no discernible order, apart from the first, which was also the earliest. Did I tell you, he said, lolling on his palliative cloud, about the time I dropped a kitten out of the window? I did not say, then or at any point, until he sank into the cloud for good that he had told me very little about his life. I had yet to hear about the attack on the president of Feathercombs Incorporated, so I could not point out to him that I sensed a motif of defenestration beginning to emerge <laughs> in his autobiography. Later, when he did tell me about Miss Mangle, the intercom, and the Czech diplomat, I would choose to skip the smart remark. Did it die? I asked him. I was eating a cup of his raspberry jello. Nothing else tempted his palate apart from a spoonful or two of the chicken soup my mother cooked for him following the recipe of my late grandmother, born and raised in France, which called for a squeeze of lemon to brighten the broth. Even the jello was not of much interest to him. There was plenty to spare. It was a third story window, my grandfather said. He added, as if his native city were known for its adamantine sidewalks in Philadelphia. How old were you? Three or four? Jesus, why would you do something like that? He poked out his tongue once, twice. That was something he did every few minutes. It often looked as if he were passing clownish judgment on something you had told him, but it was really only a side effect of the meds. His tongue was pale and had the nap of suede. I knew from a few precious demonstrations during my childhood that he could touch the tip of it to the tip of his nose. Outside the window of my mother's guest bedroom, 
The east bay sky was gray as the nimbus of hair around his suntanned face. Curiosity, my grandfather decided and stuck out his tongue. I said that I had heard curiosity could be harmful, in particular to cats. Thank you. Thanks. You know, I have heard Michael say in the past that he likes starting with hostile questions. Mm -hmm. You can um, oblige. Later, so I would invite your... those of you and those yeah. of you who know me know that I'm not adverse to asking them. Mm -hmm. um, but let, let's warm up a little bit. Okay. I, you really were a Boy Scout. I, I really was. Yes, I was a, a Cub Scout, and then I was a Boy Scout. Um, for about two years, and I never rose higher than general. Uh, what's after Tenderfoot? Scout, I think. That's, You're asking the wrong. It was like question. a second. I was I was a washout. Wait, I got all the easy merit badges that I could do without studying or preparing, like <laughs> history merit badge, and I don't know. Um, Before things got really tough. Baseball trivia merit badge or something like that. But then as soon as it required effort, I quit. You were out. Yeah, actually, and I tried to get the public health merit badge. And my, you know, they try to get fathers to sign up, or mothers too, like probably nowadays, but at the time, to be the sort of proctors or people who quiz you to make sure you've... And so my dad signed up to be the, that for the public health merit badge. Not a really popular merit badge, I don't think, but I figured, hey, I, I can swing that one. And I, my dad flunked me. Yeah. <laughs> I had to go back and do it again. So... So All I right, quit. so this is starting to explain a lot, actually. Exactly. No, but Every, can, you, yes. can you still make that Boy Scout gesture? This? Uh -huh. And it's trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Wow. A little round of applause. I'm all of those. I'm all of those things to this day. I can you, can I you do Spock, too? Of course. All right, let's see. He can do Spock, too. So live long and prosper. Is that what that, yes. that is? I used to know how to say it in Vulcan, but I can't remember. Okay. And so, all right, we're, we're going with the kid motif here for a few moments. Did you only read comic books as a kid? Oh, or, no, no. Or were you, a, were you an avid I read reader? everything. Did you have a favorite book as a child? Um, I had many favorite books. I had serial favorites. Right, um, phases. I remember... Um, I read, I, well, to get to one of my favorites before, I'm going to talk about another, another book series that I loved were these series of biographies of famous Americans when they were children. I mean, I guess some people remember those, um, which are just utter bunk, it turns out. Like, from start to finish, like, nobody knows, we know, like, two things about Andrew Jackson when he was a boy. So this whole book was, you know, 175 pages of completely invented nonsense about Andrew Jackson's childhood. And don't, don't knock the fake memoir thing. No, that's how I learned. Okay. I mean, Amer all of American history is just one big fake memoir, basically. Um, so, um, and I love these books, and, um, you know, I read them all. Like, I, and I was very, um, it didn't, I read Clara Barton, the nurse, the sort of the American Florence Nightingale. You know, I didn't, I didn't care boys' books or girls' books. I didn't really distinguish in that way. But in the book about um, somebody, maybe Daniel Boone, or maybe, maybe it was Dan Beard who founded the Boy Scouts. Anyway, I read that when he loved a book when he was a boy, he would prick his finger, and with the blood, he would write his name in blood, like in the fly leaf of whatever his favorite book was that he loved. And so I decided I was going to do that. And, I, and my favorite book at that time was The Phantom Tollbooth by oh, Norton yeah. Jester. So, I um, Jester. So I, um, that was the book I wrote my name in blood. Do you still have it? With. It's going to be worth I a lot someday. I don't then. think I do anymore, no. And it just said Mike in horror. And it didn't work, and, and the, the, <laughs> the like blood just went everywhere. It was a disaster, <laughs> like almost everything. I tried to do like that as a kid. It worked for Dan, Daniel Boone, but not for me. That's really a scary But that's a beautiful book, and that book was... That's a beautiful one. I mean, the thing that was so magical to me about that book is, if you know it, or even if you don't... Um, it, it's about this boy who's bored with life, and he, he, when he's at home, he wants to be at school. When he's at school, he wants to be home. And, and then this magical toll booth just appears in his room, and he drives his little motorized car through the toll booth, and he 
enters this um, fantastic it's kingdom. Milo, right? Yeah, Milo. And it's all wordplay and um, puns. And it's, it's just, um, I loved and still love to my children's dismay, love puns. And, um, you know, I, it was this incredible book, but it also it made a similar appearance in that one night we had somebody over for dinner, a friend of my parents, this man that I never saw ever again. And he brought a gift for me, and it was this book, The Phantom of Tobu, and it became my favorite book. So it was, in a weird way, sort of parallel to what happens to Milo in the book. Um, so, I mean, that one, um, I, you know, I reread it countless times, and, and it, I think it really did help first awaken me to the magic of words and wordplay, and, and like got me thinking about, you know, one of the things that book does is has you think about idioms. It take, people take them literally, and you know, somebody who says like it's easy as falling off a log, and then he falls off a log, and right. and um, there's an island that's called the Island of Conclusions, and you get to it by jumping, you know, and it's things like that where it, it makes a kid think, oh, jump to conclusions, like you're not just talking about the mental phenomenon of. See, that, that would be a challenge to translate for the translators here in the room to I, make. You those... probably jump to conclusions yeah. in Dutch too, don't you? I probably no. Okay. Maybe it happens. You, maybe you yeah, we, skate we have, to conclusions. We have a lot of, a lot of challenge with these uh, spreekwoorden in our house in different mm -hmm. languages, but that that is really a, a good one. And you you are not necessarily the narrator, but you you, the narrator as a child, has been kind of dismissed by the grandfather as the kind of kid, that was too prone to stating the obvious. <laughs> well, were you like no, I mean, that as a kid? Because you're certainly no, no, no. That's the grandfather sees almost the entire human race as being too prone to stating the obvious, and his grandson <laughs> just lamentably, you know, partakes of the same um, same right. fault as everyone else. That human him. stuff. Yes, exactly. Um, no, I, I don't. I mean, maybe I don't know, but it's not any. My my grandfather was um, well. He's in many ways very different than this grandfather. Um, he was a very verbal man himself. He loved puns and wordplay. He was very talkative. He was not like the taciturn um, guy in the novel. Um, but he, my grandfather definitely had his grumpy side, and he definitely had an angry side, which I only remember getting just surprising because they were so infrequent, little right. glimpses of, and, and not towards me really ever, but just I could see. And um, uh, But, I, you know, he I don't ever remember him speaking dismissively particularly to me or if he did I've forgotten so you might you were probably protected from whenever it came out yeah I mean I was just imagining how I mean this the grandfather when we see him interacting with the narrator he's usually very it's clear that he loves the narrator and that he's probably more fond of the narrator than I mean he's fond of his daughter too but that, that he's able to even to he shows Glint, like little flashes of true warmth and feeling towards his. And they're grandson. complicit, actually. You know, there are moments where they're, they're kind conspiring. of conspiring. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of conspiring. Mm -hmm. Do you ever laugh out loud at something you've written? Yes. That you've just written. Yes, I do. And but does is that Sometimes kind I'm of the only person? <laughs> <laughs> I you know I have a hard time believing that, but okay, we'll go with. Sometimes it. I start to laugh before I have even written it because I can feel something funny is coming <laughs> and I still don't know what it this is, is like yet. This is like the pre-crime unit, the pre-humor Yeah, exactly, the exactly. Pre -humor it's like thing. Minority Report but right, for exactly. jokes. Yeah. And so is, is that a test? Okay, this is a stayer. This is going to make it to the final draft if you've actually laughed out loud before, yes, before you've articulated it? Probably, but there's no guarantee that it will make it into a published book. Um, and one thing I rely on editors and readers, you know, my wife, Ayala, is my first reader. And, and, and she's I, a writer as yeah, well. Yeah, she's a writer as well. And I have a couple of other uh, trusted readers. And um, sometimes they'll say, like, this is a funny joke, but it's extraneous or it feels okay. out of place in this moment or something like that. Do you ever like repurpose those things? Do, do they ever find their ways into it's other Not gags stories? particularly, because usually it's coming out of the context so right. specifically that... You know, it's not like I'm putting one-liners in that I could toss somewhere else, but I do reuse descriptions. Sometimes if I think right. I have a really apt description of something, but I cut that whole part out, I might save the description to try to use it again. In fact, there's a greenhouse um, in the, my book Wonder Boys, or if you've seen the movie, um, you know, Sarah Gaskell in that book 
is a gardener and she has a greenhouse and um, it um, that greenhouse was actually first bestowed on a character in what was supposed to be my second novel which was a book called Fountain City that I worked on for five and a half years after my first book my Mysteries of Pittsburgh and I abandoned it um, to write Wonder Boys and then I was working with this new character of Sarah Gasco, and I'm like, she's, you gotta, you gotta give your characters hobbies, you know, right. some kind. Um, people will always want to know what other people's hobbies are. Yeah. So I thought, well, I did all that work on describing a greenhouse. Maybe I'll just pluck the greenhouse out and put it into this book, and it really, it worked well. Um, and I was able to, but that's really the only time I've ever taken such a big chunk and reused it like that. And the cool part was then when the movie went to Pittsburgh and they shot it entirely on location in Pittsburgh and for the role of the college in the movie, they used a, a prep school, high school, private high school in Pittsburgh and um, the, its campus and they needed a greenhouse and they, so they built an entire working Greenhouse, a real greenhouse, very beautiful one. Did it one. stay afterwards? And they left it? it. So now that school oh. has a greenhouse because so of the So you've actually, books. is it called the Michael Shabon Greenhouse? It they should love, be. They love to name things after yeah. people in the U.S. It's like yes. the hospital wings, especially. Yeah, in but, Israel, too. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, They're there's, named after the same people. There's a, <laughs> there's a theme. <laughs> but maybe later, when you're kind of stuck for writing, you can do an outtakes thing. You know, so you I've thought about a whole, that. A whole and when I go look, I have, I keep, I save everything that I cut, and then when I pluck bits out, so, not even always because I think they're good, just something about them, I think that maybe I could use this again. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> when I do go back sometimes and look at what's in those files, it's always so, it's always much more context specific than I remember yeah. it being. I'm like, I, I can't. You laugh I less. I just do a new one. You laugh yeah. less. So, you know, there is a lot, for those of you who have not yet read the book, there, are, there is a lot of humor in it all the way through. Um, but there's a lot of heavy, too. You know, let, let's... It has a dark side. It has a dark like side. Much like the moon. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, Colson Whitehead was here recently. And, and Pulitzer of, Prize winning author. We have a Pulitzer Prize Colson winning Whitehead. theme mm -hmm. through Amsterdam here. Journalists as well coming through. Um, but one of the things he said, he told himself in terms of writing uh, The Underground Railroad was, write that book that you've been afraid to write. Mm. Was this book in any way that book for you because it was so intense and personal? No, or? no. I mean, like I said, it took me by surprise. I didn't know I was going to write it until, until the day I started it. I didn't have a chance to be afraid of it. Alger Hiss came up and <laughs> yeah, spied exactly. on you, and that was that. Um, I mean, I, I've never, I've never, I don't think I've ever felt afraid to write a book. I've, I've felt afraid to write passages, certainly. Like, yeah. got, get to material that's either really personal or sensitive or maybe not personal to me, but personal to people in my family or something like that, where I'm like, okay... So what do you am do Am I going to do this or not? Or how am I going to do it? Um, when you're worried about hurting other people's feelings or revealing something that's yeah. too personal or private, um, well, it depends on who it is. Um, so watch out. You know, if it's someone <laughs> that you would like to revenge yourself on, then, you, of course, you just go right ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> no, if it's, you know, if it's children, with my, with my children, I have four children, um, if it's something which is not all that common, especially in my fiction, um, if it's something from their lives, um, or when I have written about them, I wrote this piece that was in GQ magazine last year about taking my son Abe to Fashion Week in Paris, and it's all about Abe. Um, and that was the assignment to write about this sort of like Mozart of This is Abe who's now into the Belgian designer. Yeah, oh no, he's, he's, he's big into Belgian, yeah. Well, uh, and the Mueller Meister, the Meister and right? Dries Van Noten, and those, those people are gods in my house. Um, for some of us. Um, but after I finished this piece, and it was hard to write that piece. I wasn't afraid to write it, but it was definitely, I wasn't looking forward to it because I knew I was going to, first of all, I'm not, I, I like clothes and I'm interested in clothing, but I'm not at all interested in fashion per se. Right. And having been to Fashion Week with Abe, like the, I, I, you know, I was just stupefied almost every, by every single show that we went to. I just, 
It was so hot, and there was no air, and, and the clothes were ridiculous for the most part, often. And, um, and wearable. I just, I didn't know how I was going to write about fashion, and I didn't know how I was going to write about Abe, especially, and what to say about him, and what, what he would be comfortable with me saying. But I, I had no choice. I had a group agreed to write this piece for GQ, so I had to write it. They paid for this whole trip to Paris for me and Abe, so... Um, you know, I tried to find the right tone, which took me a long time to find where I thought there was just that trying to hit that um, the right amount of both in terms of saying things about Abe that he would be comfortable with me saying. Also and, 10 years down the road? No, just right now. Just right now. And um, also, not I don't want to seem like I was just bragging or showing off or just saying, look, isn't my kid adorable or isn't my kid remarkable? I wanted it to be about him and why he loves fashion and why he loves clothes and what he was interesting to him about it. Um, but then once it was done, he was the first person I gave it to to read. You know, I wanted him to tell me, like, right. you went too far here, or I'm not comfortable with this. Or, and was he okay with it? Yeah, he was fine with it. And all he had for me were, were corrections. <laughs> you know, it was like, no, that was, you know, um, what's his name? It was Eddie Eddie Salman's 2014 right. oh. spring summer collection. <laughs> You know, not 2015, you idiot. Can, can we actually, can we stay on the clothing theme for a minute sure. here? I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And we did, not, we did not plan this. Because you sure seem to enjoy playing with your cast's wardrobe in, that, in this book. Oh, I love writing about clothes. And I'm just going to, may I share a few examples? Sure. You know, it made me a little self-conscious picking out my outfit for this evening. You did and, well. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> You, you have to hear this, and, and I'm going to just read, you know, three of the 500 that are in this book. So one of the grand scenes that plays a pivotal role when, when the grandparents meet is at a synagogue uh, event called Night in Monte Carlo, and he first describes Jews dressed as fanciful Cubans, and then... Band. Oh, that's the band. Yeah. Of course it is. And then we get to see the grandmother in her young, beautiful, early days. And you describe her. She was wearing sunglasses indoors at night. Around her shoulders, the remains of what had been a fox sank its teeth into itself. Then later, when the narrator <laughs> meets the doctor, uh, or describes the doctor that is taking care of the grandmother in, in a mental institution, Dr. Medved's head was a thumb up thrust from his shirt collar. Picture that. White lab coat worn open over a summer suit the color of a manila folder, purple bow tie. And then we get later an older woman at a synagogue. She was wearing shapeless knit pants, cheddar orange, and a shapeless knit pullover top, black and orange poppies on a white ground. Her glasses were orange too, you know. And we see the grandfather in wearing rubber waders over stained chinos. We see platform saddle shoes. So, where did was this inspired by your son or oh, your no, your no. time in Fashion Week, or have you always been? I I, I mean I notice. That's part of. I mean I think most people you tend to notice something about what people are wearing, and you tend to, maybe a lot of time unconsciously label people according to what they're wearing and and you can sort of you can at least think to yourself oh I, I know you because of the brand of shirt you're wearing and that kind of stuff I and mean, we're all responding to constantly to those kind of cues but um, I you know I try to um, I try to find a balance between walk between you know over describing and over describing and by you know trying to give enough to because I'm relying on those same kind of codes for the reader too, like there's a okay. description of the grandfather that's like he's wearing um, not Birkenstocks, but imitation Israeli Birkenstocks <laughs> over socks, right? right? And then later, this woman that he ends up having a fling with in their in their <clears throat> golden years um, thinks like he's dressed like the director of a Jewish Jewish socialist summer camp. So <laughs> like she's you see that her. you see her reading the clue of his clothing. Right. Too, right. you know that that's how we proceed. So I mean, I think it's it's a part of setting the scene, um, but you also don't want to get you you have to try to make it succinct so that you're not bogging 
the reader down. You, you don't want to just describe what people are wearing just for the sake of describing what they're wearing. You ha it has to somehow characterize them in some way, or else I won't do it. Telegraph some kind of. Yeah, thing I mean, if someone know. were just wearing a T-shirt and jeans, I probably wouldn't bother to say there what they were wearing. There aren't any of those in here, by but, the way. Just right. Spoiler. I mean, it's a wasted opportunity, yeah. and especially with a character that might not even be on on stage very long and they only have maybe one moment and you want to really nail them like that old lady, right, right. you know, I just, I, I knew yeah, just no, what she was wearing. Even the minor wearing. characters are in full, are in full bloom, which is <laughs> wonderful. So let's get back to the seriousness uh, for a moment. Oh, do you want to, do we want to get back to the question of, of, um, okay. of taking revenge on people through, through writing about them? Or I think you'd like to, I think you'd like to go back to revenge. So I'm I happy just to have, go, I'm happy to go more, back. I have one more, just one more, element, which is, I, you know, I was saying with my children, I would always Make check you with them be very polite and to consult you. them. Yes, watch yes. yourself. It's all coming back. Um, but um, with parents, fuck them. <laughs> I mean, and I always say, like, um, you know, that's... Well, have you know that my children are in the audience? Okay. Just remember what I said. So only you, in writing, though. When you become writers... It's only true in writing. But um, it's, you know, I, always, I tell my... You don't ask their permission, you mean. No, far from it. And I always, when, when, and on the rare occasions when they have been upset by something I've written because they thought it was too whatever personal or revelatory, I, apo I apologize. But then I say, that's what you get for raising a writer. So it's their fault. It's their fault. It started. It's the clearly movie. their fault. Right. And I expect that that's what my children will say to me one day if they take up the trade too. Right, right. Um, but it's, you know, the thing is, you can't worry about that stuff. That, because you're going to be second guessing everything, and the problem with it, it's a mugs game. Because the 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 things you are often it's happened so many times. Things I well, like should I say this? Can I say this? They sail past the person that you're worried about doesn't even notice it. They don't right. realize it, and and you think of all the sweat you expended worrying about this thing that you thought was going to upset somebody, and and half the time it's also happened like they think you're talking about somebody else. They're like you really nailed him. Like okay. <laughs> And, and then the other, then the rest of the time, they get upset about things you never thought in a million that you still don't see why they're upset about. It. Objectively, it doesn't seem upsetting, but they got upset by it. So but it's can't. never a reason to take it out or change it. Well, once it's published. No, no. no it's oh, you're too talking late. about revenge like after. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no, I've never, I've like, never written anything. You know, the 18-year-old, don't ask if you can borrow the keys to the car, just take them. And apologize right? later. You can ask, if you ask, they'll only say no. Exactly. Okay, I get it. That's I, how you I, handle parents. I get how that works. Okay, are you guys taking notes? See, oh, they, they know, know it already, they know. believe All right, anyway. <laughs> They're pros. Um, I, I want to ask about the war. Here. Okay. Just to, you know, this is not a war novel, no. per se, but... Some of the most beautiful, poignant, moving, whatever you want to call it, scenes in this book, I think, are the wartime scenes. Thank you. And especially, you know, the scenes where this grandfather character is a young man, a young Jewish American engineer soldier, has this incredible bonding experience with this old priest in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. Father Nickel. And they bond out of a mutual passion for rocketry mm. and, and astronomy and astronomy, and out of mutual respect. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but thinking, you know, isn't this just such an amazing example of reaching across the aisle? You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's no bigger aisle than this one to reach mm -hmm. across. And what can we all learn from, from this, this kind of scene? And I wonder if you just talk about that just for, for a minute, maybe even read a couple of words from it if, you, okay. if you're so inclined. Okay, do you know so where, where I, it is? I do. Okay. I do. Your book is so beautifully is marked so up. I've never seen one quite so <laughs> thoroughly. So this is the Father Nickel. You know, you can decide oh, yeah. which, which piece, but there are just some gorgeous uh, pieces in there. But it's an unlikely pair, this young Jewish soldier and this old Nazi priest basically, you know, bonding in the woods. Yes. Um, I'll say also, this reminds me that today I was made aware that today is the, um, what, 70th, um, no, it must be the... 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. No, 72nd, I guess, anniversary of the capture of, um, 
a V2, the first capture of a V2 rocket by Allied troops, by American troops going into Germany, which is exactly when this is happening. It's in early April or mid-April. Um, so yeah, this priest, um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's right here. Yeah, so these three American soldiers, including the grandfather, are making their way through Germany. The grandfather is part of this thing called Operation, it came to be called Operation Paperclip, um, which was the U.S. Um, intelligence effort to capture and collect as much um, uh, material and documents and people as they could pertaining to various aspects of the German um, scientific and technological um, uh, apparatus, which was in most respects way far in advance of what the United States or anybody else was doing at the time, things like plastics um, and sort of benign things like that, but also really fearsome, terrible things like germ warfare and chemical warf warfare and rockets and jet tech technology. You know, the Ger Germans brought jet fighters online right at the very end of the war when it was too late. So, and the, and the Soviet Union was trying to do exactly the same thing and they were coming from the east and the US was coming from the west and, and the British were in, in, involved in it too and the French to a lesser degree. And um, um, so the grandfather's one of these guys who's, he's an engineer, he's been trained and he's a soldier and he's been told just find this stuff, bag it, tag it and we're bringing, we're bringing it, home. it home. So um, they've made their way and the war's still going on but it's clearly going to be ending soon and they just, through various um, complicated means they come to spend the night on this farm outside of um, a semi-invented town of Wellinghausen, Germany. Um, and the, they, they get put in the bed, in the most comfortable bed in the farmhouse. They, they, they put themselves in. They make the old priest and his sister sleep in the barn, um, which is what soldiers did. And um, But the grandfather's too comfortable to sleep. He's too warm and too well-fed and too not comfortable used to, to it. not used to it. So he wakes up and he comes out in the middle of the night. Um, I'll just read a little bit. Father Nichol sat hunched on a tall stool, his telescope pointed at the sky. For a city boy like my grandfather, the number of visible stars had always been only a dim fraction of the 5,000 or so he knew were visible to the naked human eye. Even in the countryside, in basic training, there was ambient light enough to conceal the true madness of the heavens. On a clear night in blacked out countryside, in between bomber runs, where the tracer fire ceased and the searchlights went dark, the stars did not fill the sky so much as coat it like hoarfrost on a window pane. You looked up and saw the starry night, he told me. You realized that Van Gogh was a realist painter. Van Gogh, sorry. <laughs> Tonight, however, my gra as my grandfather joined Father Nickel at the telescope, the stars were lost in the dazzle of a full moon. Also, of course, a large swath of Westphalia was on fire. Smoke cobwebbed the vault of night. You should rest, no doubt. My grandfather reached into the left hip pocket of the coat he was wearing and found a 10-pack carton of Luckies. He tore open a pack and offered a Lucky to Father Nickel. Neither of them had a light. My grandfather crept back into the house with a piece of straw and lit it in the embers of the hearth. Once he got his cigarette going, he lit Father Nickel's and carried it back out to the priest. They looked up at the moon hung from the sky like a mirror. Permit me to show you my little mountain. Father Nichols said. He's an amateur astronomer, but he's actually made some observations that have, whoops, have gotten, uh-oh. So here it is, something named after him. It's this mountain he's anxious to show to the grandfather. My grandfather hunched over the oculus of the telescope. It was an old but excellent telescope, lovingly maintained. Father Nichols had fitted the eyepiece with a lunar filter to reduce the glare of moonlight. The resultant detail came as a shock. The rays of craters were sharp as cracks starring a mirror. The edge of the lunar disk was toothed like the blade of a circular saw. 
Somewhere in the center of the Montes Apenninus, according to the old priest, rose little Mons Gallienus. You see Mons Huygens, he said, you know it? I, yes, I see it. Now look, perhaps three degrees of arc to the southeast, you will see a shadow, a patch of gray. To my mind, it resembles, resembles the print of a deer's hoof. Right. Now from there, look, let us say, two degrees of arc to the northeast. Okay. It is there. Right. It has an almost castellated appearance. Ah. You see it? Yes. Father Nickel clucked his tongue. You don't see it, he said. <laughs> Not without a trace of bitterness. In fact, due to the Earth's rotation, the image of the moon had already drifted out of the eyepiece. The telescope would have to be slewed. I'm sure I did, my grandfather said. Castellated is the perfect word. That's great. And then later, of course, they, they come into, uh, or there's a description of the, the V2 rocket making machinery, which is basically a slave pit in, in Nordhausen. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of things that at least I didn't know reminded me in some ways of Richard Flanagan's uh, The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Oh, I don't know that. All the, the uh, Japanese having their allied prisoners work as slaves in deplorable, mm. disease-ridden, death-like sure. conditions to build uh, this useless, what turned out to be a useless railway between Thailand and Burma. Uh -huh. Oh, it's sort of like Bridge on the River Kwai yeah. kind of thing. Okay. And, you know, I was wondering, is there a difference between all that evil that ends up in something valuable and spectacular like moon and space travel? You know, this V2 rocket, right, that all the kids draw is what mm -hmm. you say. Um, or would we have just been better off with no I mean, space program to begin with? This is an unfair ethics I mean, the space program is, I suppose, debatable. I mean, I could see somebody saying, obviously, yes, of course. Who cares? We, you send some, you know, 25,000 pounds of metal to the moon and then leave and never go back. What was the big deal about yeah. it? Um, I, so that Not one I could, I could see, um, you know, it's, but it's, it can be hard. I mean, some things are hard, like, um, you know, African slavery um, in the United States was clearly a monstrous evil. So better it should never have happened, right? But then there'd be no jazz music. There'd be no, I mean, American culture has been so incredibly enriched by, by African Americans and what they brought to culture from the very beginning. Um, so should we just say, better. It's better never to have had it. And so screw jazz and forget Louis Armstrong and forget Miles Davis and forget all that stuff. You know, I don't know the answer to that. You, I could see arguing both sides of it. Yeah, Side. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. It happened. Um, you know, um, There's no undo. So we, we are the, pro the it's It's more... <clears throat> the question of Von Braun and the rocket is more germane, I think, because we never have... Res like, we've resolved it. Slavery's bad. It shouldn't happen. If it occurs, we should try to stop it. I mean, there's pretty much it's pretty black general and white, agreement binary, about that. Yeah. Um, with... Technology, we still haven't solved this yet. And the question of what, what, are, what is the responsibility of scientists and, and I mean, we've tried, but um, I think m even maybe more relevant to the question is less about the intentions of scientists that um, can be good or evil or whatever, or neutral or benign, um, but just that the unforeseen consequences of right. technology, things that even that you think are going, well, things that you, that are meant to be instruments of, of death and destruction then become instruments of exploration and science, but things that are and meant to be versa, yeah. beautiful, good things can, can turn out to be utter disasters. And it's that, it's, I mean, I think, and sometimes I think the best way to study human history would be to study unforeseen consequences because that's all it really amounts to in the end. Let me ask you one last question before we open things up, and then if we have time, I might have some more. But you talk about responsibility, you know, in this case of, of science, and I've heard you talk about responsibility of writers as well. And we're going to have to just spend one minute talking about writers and, and politics here for. I get a <coughs> sense you're about to utter a certain five-letter word that starts with a T. <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't mention it, but I will say that since 
Since the campaign and the election, certainly, um, you know, writers have been extremely vocal, protesting on the streets of the New York Public Library, holding candlelight vigils at mm -hmm. the, the AWP, you know, the Writers Conference mm -hmm. in Washington, sending books to the White House. Do writers still have a role or even a responsibility to resist, to speak out, you know, whether it be through their stories, you know, the way the Soviet dissidents did uh, through their literature or outside their stories? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I think everyone has a responsibility. I don't think writers have like a special responsibility, but I think everyone has a responsibility to use whatever tools they are handy with. Um, to do what they can to protest and resist. So if you're a writer, obviously writing is going to be, right. uh, you know, the most, the handiest way that you have. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's been looking at unforeseen consequences, talking about unforeseen consequences, you know, I think um, as utterly disastrous as it is and has been to have um, this individual his name I just I can't <laughs> anyway to have him be president is, um, is an unforeseen consequence no the unforeseen consequence is now we have um, a real enemy to fight and we and the progressive movement and, and liberal politics in the United States has been sort of drifting and wandering and everyone's sort of been biting each other's ankles for decades um, and there's you know it's this kind of sense of purpose and focus and having a clear um, agenda that is being set by um, the, the Trump administration that makes that you can you know what to do or you know who to a what to say and how and whom to say it to and, and I think that's been that's a good thing because there was a kind of rudderlessness yeah. um, and we got complacent we got we got you know we had eight years of Obama and it was sort of easy to um, just start to lapse into this endless bickering over not trivial things but things that now by contrast seem less important than this having this right. this as overwhelming um, hideousness to disperse. Thought, <laughs> thought we were in a territory that that it was a gain and it turned out that yes that it wasn't right.